Good morning. Welcome. I'm Nicole Myers, Interim Chief Curator and the Barbara Thomas Lemon Senior Curator of European Art here at the Dallas Museum of Art. Along with Ninka Bakker, Senior Curator of Van Gogh Paintings at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, I'm also the co-curator of Van Gogh and the Olive Groves. The exhibition is in its final week here in Dallas. It closes on February 6th, and after that, it's going to travel to the Van Gogh Museum, our partner in Amsterdam, where it will be on view from March 11th through June 12th. I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning for our virtual symposium, Van Gogh and the Olive Groves, Impressions of Provence, which was made possible by the Consulate General of the Netherlands in New York as part of the Dutch Culture USA program. We're so grateful to be able to offer this special event. And I'm also grateful that my co-presenters, Ninka Bakker and Renska Cohen Terfart, were able to fly to Dallas from Holland in the wee hours of this morning to be here to present. Van Gogh and the Olive Groves is the very first exhibition to bring together the extraordinary series of paintings dedicated to olive trees that Van Gogh produced during his year-long stay at the Asylum, or Mental Health Clinic, in saint Remy, a small town in southern France in the region of Provence. From the moment he arrived in the spring of 1889, Van Gogh was struck by saint Remy's distinctive Provencal character. Although he'd only moved about 16 miles to the east of Arles, where he'd lived the previous year, he found his new environment to be markedly different. He was captivated by saint Remy's wilder, more rugged nature and the dramatic backdrop of the Alpil Mountains. In contrast to the fertile plain that borders Arles, the soil in saint Remy is rocky and arid, making it less suitable to the agricultural motifs that had previously attracted the artist, such as fruit orchards, grain fields, and vineyards. Instead, what thrived in the hilly countryside surrounding the asylum were olive trees, both cultivated in rows within groves and growing wild along the rolling foothills of the Alpil. The olive groves surrounding the asylum were among Van Gogh's first subjects once he received permission to leave the asylum's grounds. But as he spent more time in his new home, he became equally attracted to the dark, flame-like forms of the cypress trees punctuating the arid landscape, as well as the alpeel, which at first appear as relatively generic backdrops in his paintings before becoming a meaningful subject in its own right. For Van Gogh, the olive trees, cypresses, and alpeels were characteristic of the region, and they represented the spirit of Provence. Over the course of his stay at the asylum, Van Gogh came to recognize the potential of each of these subjects, both as standalone series and as a larger ensemble that he dubbed Impressions of Provence, the topic of our symposium today. Our speakers this morning will take a deeper dive into this Impressions of Provence, exploring the intrinsic appeal and significance of each of these three motifs, as well as their place within Van Gogh's larger artistic production. Each talk will last about 20 minutes, and at the very end of the presentation, we'll be very happy to take your questions, which can be submitted at any time through the YouTube chat window on the DMA's event page. We look forward to connecting with you at the end, and with that, we'll seg into our first talk. I'm thrilled to kick off our symposium by introducing one of the main themes that we explore in our exhibition, namely Van Gogh's practice of producing works in series and the greater context for his olive groves within his 10-year career. Over the course of six months, that is, between June and December of 1889, Van Gogh produced a striking series of paintings that capture olive trees at different times of day and in different seasons. In order to really know a subject, he believed you had to study it seriously, which meant repeatedly and directly from life. Only then could you truly seize its quintessential nature and translate that into painting through color, line, and form, all with the aim of imparting something meaningful or stirring an emotional response in us, the viewer. In Van Gogh's quest to decipher the olive trees, he returned to his subject no less than 15 times in an attempt to express what he felt was their ancient and mysterious character. The olive grove paintings hold a special place within Van Gogh's production, 
but it's not because they belong to a series. In fact, Van Gogh had a penchant for producing work serially, either in small groups or larger ensembles, throughout his short yet productive career. His approach to this practice began to crystallize in the summer of 1884, that's five years earlier than uh, the time he spent in San Remy. In 1884, he was living in his native Holland and was only a few years into his newly pronounced career as an artist. On the lookout for meaningful subjects, he wrote to his younger brother Theo, his confidant and financial supporter, about something he'd seen in the countryside that he hoped to paint. And it's a really long quote, but it's really beautiful and indicative, so I hope you'll bear with me as I read it to you. He told Theo, these last few days, I've repeatedly seen the same subject, time and again, in all sorts of variants. I assure you that it was thoroughly authentic, most perfectly artistic, and it preoccupies me greatly. The site was of peasant women laboring in the wheat fields, and he went on to explain that it lent itself well to the representation of summer, a season he felt was difficult to capture. He continued, it isn't easy to find the effect of a summer sun that's as lush and as simple and as pleasant to look at as the characteristic effects of the other seasons. The spring is tender green, young wheat, and pink apple blossom. The autumn is the contrast of the yellow leaves against violet tones. The winter is the snow with the little black silhouettes. But if the summer is the opposition of blues against an element of orange and the golden bronze of the wheat, one could paint a painting in each of the contrasts of the complementary colors, red and green, blue and orange, yellow and violet, white and black, that really expressed the mood of the seasons. This discussion of color is more important and deliberate than it might seem, as it reveals Van Gogh's interest in the scientific color theory known as simultaneous contrast, in which pairs of complementary colors, those that are opposite each other on the color wheel like red and green, are laid down next to each other in order to increase their overall vibrancy. Van Gogh associates each of the complementary pairs with the season, and this guiding principle will inform his approach to landscapes throughout his career. With this plan for a series developing in his mind, it must have come as quite a delight when just a few weeks later, he received a commission to paint six decorative panels for the dining room of Anton Hermans, a jeweler who was also his drawing pupil. Although Hermans initially asked for a religious cycle depicting various saints, Van Gogh persuaded him to accept an allegorical scheme of the four seasons symbolized by peasant labor. He sent Theo drawings of the various compositions he devised and I'm showing you them here. A sower, a plowman, a shepherd, which is known today only by the painted composition, wheat harvesters, again known only from a sketch in a letter, potato planters, and an ox cart in the snow. Both the subjects and compositions of Van Gogh's decorative cycle reflect his great admiration of French Barbizon and naturalist painters of the 19th century, such as Jean-Francois Millet, Mie's depictions of peasant labor as allegories of the passage of time resonated powerfully with Van Gogh, particularly those that allude to Christian doctrine, such as the sower that you're seeing there on the left. Van Gogh knew the painting from etchings, and he would copy it multiple times all throughout his career. So you're seeing Van Gogh's drawing after reproduction from 1881 in the middle, and then his sketch for the sower composition for the dining room decor in 1884 on the right. Only four of the six compositions painted for the dining room survive, and I'm showing you these as a reference point for Van Gogh's artistic development in 1884. For though he sought to infuse his paintings with contrasting complementary colors, it would be quite a while before we see him successfully putting it into practice. What I find most interesting in these early paintings is the elongated rectangular format. The shape and dimensions were dictated by the paneling in Hermann's dining room, but they foreshadow the long rectang rectangular canvases and even some of the subjects that Van Gogh would paint six years later in Auvers in what would be his last series of paintings in the final two months of his life. And you're seeing a few examples of those there on the right. The dining room commission was formative for Van Gogh. Not only did he develop a lifelong practice of personifying the seasons in his paintings through the rhythms of agrarian life, from planting and flowering to ripening and harvest, as well as through contrasting complementary color schemes. But he also recognized the potential for paintings produced in series to serve as decorations in middle-class homes. 
Having worked at an art gallery as a young man, Van Gogh was constantly thinking about how to make his work more marketable. And the creation of large thematic series, which he often organized into smaller, more saleable ensembles, emerged as a strategy over the course of his career. In 1886, Van Gogh relocated to Paris, and he moved in with his brother Theo, who himself worked as a dealer in an art gallery. During Van Gogh's two-year stay, he created several series and decorative ensembles, such as this triptych, or a group or ensemble of three paintings, which is part of a larger series of three sets of triptychs devoted to the subject of springtime in Paris. Van Gogh's thinking was that while a collector might not be able to buy all nine paintings in the series, they might be able to purchase a smaller triptych or ensemble from within it. And here we're starting to see him imply that contrast of green and pink or green and red to represent uh, the springtime season. Of these two canvases, which belong to a series of six paintings depicting the neighborhood of Montmartre in Paris where the brothers lived, Van Gogh explained to Theo the whole lot will make a decoration for a dining room or a house in the country. With his move to the city of Arles in southern France in March of 1888, Van Gogh's concept of producing works in series and decorative ensembles began to take on a more important role as a cohesive element within his larger body of work. Upon arrival, he dove into a series of blossoming fruit trees that represent the season of spring, and that he once again organized into three groups of triptychs. So I'm showing you one of those here, along with the illustration that he sent to Theo, where he described it as the initial idea for a much larger definitive decoration, his word, decoration, that would be completed the following year. The subject of spring, as represented by flowering fruit trees, had been popularized by Barbizon artists like Millet and Charles-Francois Daubigny. As well as by Impressionists like Claude Monet and Camille Pissarro, and works like these influenced Van Gogh's selection of motifs. However, his choice to represent spring as a series of paintings reveals the strong influence of contemporary Japanese yukioi woodblock prints, which frequently render one motif through different viewpoints, seasons, and weather conditions, and were often produced as diptychs or pairs, triptychs, groups of three or even larger series. On the left, you're seeing a print from Utagawa Hiroshige's 100 Famous Views of Edo. As the title suggests, Hiroshige created a series of 100 prints that feature different views of the city over the course of a year, and he organized them into four parts following the four seasons. Van Gogh, who was an avid admirer and collector of such prints, made his own painted version after the plum orchard, and you see it there in the middle, and he would go on to incorporate aspects of these Japanese woodblock print style into one of his flowering fruit trees from the spring series he began in Arles. Perhaps the biggest lesson that Van Gogh learned from Japanese woodblock prints was the benefit of depicting a single subject over and over again in order to distill its most essential characteristics, both symbolic and physical, a lesson that defined his work in Provence. With the transition of spring to summer, Van Gogh shifted his focus to capturing the ripening and harvest of wheat fields in the fertile plain that bordered Arles in a series of about 10 paintings, and I'm showing you three of those here. Here's where we're really starting to see Van Gogh rocking and rolling with color theory, contrasting the bronzed and golden color of the wheat against the vibrant blue skies, all in an effort to symbolize summer. Shortly after completing the series, he would write to Theo, Nothing would make it easier for us to place our canvases than to get them widely accepted as decorations in bourgeois homes. Van Gogh would take this idea of painting decor for middle-class homes to its natural conclusion with his creation of a large cycle painted expressly to decorate the house he rented in Arles, which he called the Yellow House, in preparation for the arrival of his friend, the painter Paul Gauguin, that fall, the project began with a group of sunflowers, and then it grew to include small portraits and a series of paintings titled The Poet's Garden, and you're seeing examples from those various series here on the screen. The decorative scheme for the Yellow House eventually expanded to include a variety of subjects and genres, among them some of Van Gogh's most celebrated and iconic paintings. 
And within the larger decorative ensemble, he singled out unexpected subgroups, such as this triptych, which he described as decoration for a ship's cabin. The whole cycle would eventually encompass about 46 paintings that, beyond decorating the Yellow House, Van Gogh hoped to exhibit under the collective title Decoration, with a capital D, in Paris during the run of the 1889 World's Fair, but which sadly never came to fruition. Van Gogh had intended to return to the fruit orchards the following spring to create a more ambitious series of larger canvases, but he was forced to abandon this plan when a series of severe mental breakdowns between December of 1888 and April of 1889 left him frequently in and out of the hospital and unable to work. Nevertheless, in the weeks before his departure for the asylum in San Remy that May, he returned to the orchards, producing four more paintings of blossoming fruit trees. And it was likely with this unrealized series in mind that Van Gogh headed into the countryside of San Remy in June of 1889, the moment he was granted freedom to leave the asylum's grounds. In search of subjects that evoke both the character of the season and also of the region, he started with the familiar, painting wheat ripening in the field behind the asylum and a typical symbolic portrayal of summer before delving into the olive groves that grew just beyond its stone wall and in fact that you can even see peeking out in these paintings. Van Gogh started the olive tree series as he normally did when embarking upon a new subject. He began by making a small plein air sketch that you see there on the left before tackling larger canvases that explore the motif in a variety of styles and compositions. In order to capture the dazzling light and heat of Provence in summer, he adopted the impression of short and flickering brush strokes and high keyed palette. Typical of his serial production, the olive growth developed organically without preconceived notions of what the picture should look like or even how many would be in the series. As was frequently the case with his various ensembles and decorative series, the painting's aesthetic cohesion is based on the decorative principle of opposition, near versus far, open versus closed, free versus structured brushwork, short and round versus tall and tapered trees, and so on. For example, he countered the dizzying enclosed viewpoint in the first two paintings there on the left where you barely see any sky at all, with a more level and expansive view in the third and fourth pictures in the series. Far from adopting a rigid or fixed process, Van Gogh was flexible and adaptive, and this was really the hallmark of his serial production. He also seized aesthetic and symbolic opportunities as they presented themselves. He reassigned paintings within particular groupings as the series expanded, and as we've seen, he often mixed and matched works from separate series. His pairing of the olive trees with the starry night is a case in point. At last I have a landscape with olive trees, and also a new study of a starry sky, he wrote to Theo in mid-June, going on to explain that the two paintings were executed in the new synthetist style developed by his friends Gauguin and Emile Bernard the year before. Synthetism developed as a reaction against Impressionism and Neo-Impressionism, styles that were devoted to the optical transcription of the natural world by use of a more scientific and orderly application of color and line. Instead, synthetism prioritized the synthesis of an artist's subjective thoughts and feelings with greatly exaggerated or simplified lines, anti-naturalistic color, and simplified forms in order to express something deeper about the subject. Synthetism also emphasized the role of invention and abstraction in the artistic process, and indeed, Van Gogh produced both the olive trees and the starry night largely, if not entirely, in his studio by combining his observations and studies from nature with his memory and imagination. Likely intended as pendants or a pair, they are united by their opposition of day and night, as well as their abstracted synthetic style that works to convey the symbolism of the trees that are at the heart of both of their compositions. The olive groves from June and July that I'm showing you here reflect the diverse and experimental approach that is typical of Van Gogh's production, really when he's focusing on series. What is remarkable, however, and what sets this series apart from his other large and ambitious projects is the incredible stylistic and intellectual cohesion 
that defines the second half of its production. In mid-July, Van Gogh was blindsided by the return of his mental illness in an acute breakdown that left him completely incapacitated and unable to work for six weeks. He began to slowly recover in late August, but he wouldn't return to paint outdoors for another month. He eventually headed back into the olive groves in late September and October, re-familiarizing himself with his subject, whose appearance had changed with the shift in seasons, and you're seeing that in these three smaller scale studies and the shift of the palette in particular. Van Gogh was determined to continue the Olive Grove series, which he felt he'd yet to really truly capture, but he was also eager to explore other motifs that he felt signified the region. He began to formulate the concept for a larger ensemble that would combine the Olive Groves with additional series dedicated to cypress trees and the Alpeel Mountains. When I'm back, he wrote to Theo in October, at best it will form a kind of ensemble, impressions of Provence. In many ways, this larger group of characteristic regional motifs echoed the decoration he produced for the Yellow House. But by calling the ensemble impressions, and by implying his intent to exhibit them up north, presumably in Paris, Van Gogh also seemed to be deliberately aligning himself with Monet, an impressionist he greatly admired and who had had recent success exhibiting serial paintings in Paris. Monet began making series of landscapes that singled out motifs from different regions in France around 1886, the year that Van Gogh had moved to Paris. Van Gogh had in fact visited Monet's 1887 exhibition at Georges Petit's gallery, which included eight paintings executed in the coastal village of Belleisle in Northwest France. Featuring a limited range of motifs, in an equally limited range of compositions, the series enjoyed significant critical and financial success with nearly every painting selling on the spot. And I'm showing you two of those works that were shown in that exhibition. Less than a year later, Theo would organize his own exhibition of a new series of paintings by Monet that capture a handful of views of Antibes, a coastal town in southern France. Monet had captured these views in varying conditions of light, an atmosphere over the course of four months. The exhibition was another critical and financial smash. Van Gogh couldn't see the show, as by that time he was living in Arles, but he discussed it enthusiastically in his letters with his brother Theo, who had sent him pretty vivid descriptions of the paintings. In fact, he gushed, Van Gogh did, about the painting on the right to others in his letters based on Theo's descriptions of the composition and the color. Van Gogh had also read with pleasure the preface to the exhibition catalog that Theo had sent to him. Its description of Monet as capturing, quote, all that is characteristic of the region and all that is delicious to the season, end quote, must have surely struck a chord with Van Gogh. Monet's example also permeated Van Gogh's time in Saint Remy, especially in the fall of 1889. During his long convalesc convalescence in the asylum, Van Gogh had read another essay on the Impressionist in the catalog accompanying a recent exhibition that brought together works by Monet and Rodin. The essay's author, Octave Mirbeau, praised Monet's revolutionary paintings, declaring them to be the product of the artist's, quote, moral isolation, self-focus, and immersion in nature, end quote. Mirbeau cast the painter's process as scientific, like that of Georges Seurat, the inventor of the pointillist style, and he described it as methodical, rational, and rigorous. It was in this context that Van Gogh announced his intention to create a larger ensemble of regional motifs, his impressions of Provence. In October, he promptly shifted his attention to painting the Alpiel, but this new series came to a screeching halt the moment he learned what Gauguin and Bernard had been up to that summer. In November, Van Gogh received letters from both of his friends bearing reproductions and descriptions of their recent synthetist paintings depicting Christ and the Garden of Olives, a watercolor sketch from Gauguin and a photograph from Bernard. Van Gogh was stunned to see the extreme direction that their synthetist style had taken. He complained to Theo that their paintings were entirely imagined with nothing observed from nature. And though he initially thought that his own paintings needed to be more accentuated, more exaggerated, to express the quintessential character of his Provençal motifs, 
He now saw the inventive abstraction that he'd explored in his synthetist Olive Trees and Starry Night as, in his words, a dangerous setback. The antidote he wrote to Theo in November was to reimmerse himself in nature. Sound familiar? He headed back into the olive groves, this time at dawn and at dusk, producing five large paintings in the course of a few weeks. In order to evoke the fleeting effects of light and atmosphere, Van Gogh relied upon the techniques of Impressionism and Neo-Impressionism, styles that were perceived as rational and scientific in their aim to record the optical sensation of light. As he explained to Theo, he did away with the thick impostos that characterized his earlier paintings, replacing them with thinner, more controlled applications of paint and a dazzling array of color. What I've done is a rather harsh and coarse realism beside their abstractions, he recounted, but it will nevertheless impart the rustic note and will smell of the soil. Perhaps the most striking things about the five November olive groves are Van Gogh's adoption of an almost identical compositional structure and viewpoint in each of the paintings, as well as their stylistic cohesion. Individual colors are applied in orderly dabs, dashes, and dots that channel both Monet and Seurat, the leaders of the modern realist school. Single-minded in focus and in purpose, there was nothing organic about how Van Gogh resumed and ultimately completed the Olive Grove series. Along with the three large paintings he completed in the summer, these five new olive groves, which were all the same size, constituted what he described to Theo as an attack on the problem posed by Gauguin and Bernard. Van Gogh would bring the Olive Grove series to its conclusion in December, making repetitions and variants of earlier compositions that feature men and women laboring in the olive groves, a return to one of his favorite motifs, the autumn harvest, so redolent of the passage of time, both natures and humankinds. Van Gogh seemed to sense the weight of his achievement, as well as the potential to garner critical and financial success by expanding upon his highly original series dedicated to regional French motifs, just as Monet had done. I still have the great desire to do for the mountains and for the cypresses what I've just done for the olive trees, have a really good go at them, he wrote to Theo in late November. The thing is, the olive tree and the cypress have rarely been painted. I think that this must be the center of the work I've done here and there in Provence, and then we can conclude the stay here when it's convenient. But despite the strong desire to remain in Saint-Rémy until his impressions of Provence was complete, this unfortunately would not come to be. In late December of 1889, Van Gogh suffered another of what became significant reoccurring breakdowns that left him weak and despondent throughout the winter and spring. Convinced that the asylum was exacerbating his illness, he left for auvers sur oise a small village north of Paris on May 13, 1890, having only completed the Olive Grove series. Looking back on his production from Provence, Van Gogh felt the olive groves were among his very best work. Indeed, they're a powerful demonstration of what he believed was the future of modern art. Paintings based on the direct observation of everyday life that employed color, line, and form to express deeper meaning about the subject, and that in turn moved us, the modern viewer. But unlike Millet's sowers and reapers that he emulated, Unlike Monet's serial views of remote French coastlines that he admired from afar, the olive trees were his and his alone. Thank you so much. Just a little reminder that we will have a question and answer session at the very end of the presentation, so please feel free, those of you tuning in virtually, to enter your questions into the chat window on the YouTube page throughout the various talks, and we will address them at the end. I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Ninka Bakker, the Van Gogh Museum's senior curator of Van Gogh paintings and co-curator of Van Gogh and the Olive Groves. Ninka was part of the editorial team behind the online version of Van Gogh's Complete Correspondence, which is an incredible resource, vangoletters.org, as well as the six-volume publication, Vincent Van Gogh, The Letters. She has curated several exhibitions on Van Gogh and late 19th century art, including Van Gogh's Letters, Van Gogh at Work, 
Van Gogh, Daubigny, Monet, Impressions of Landscape, and Van Gogh and Japan. For today's symposium, Ninka will, will be taking us on a deeper dive into Van Gogh cypresses. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you very much, Nikki, for this introduction. Um, let me just start by thanking you for inviting me, and it's, it's great to be in Dallas, uh, being back in Dallas, I must say, and uh, I'm, I can't wait to see uh, the exhibition, which we will go see in a moment. Um, now, I'm going to talk about Van Gogh's cypresses. In the region of Provence, in the south of France, the cypress is just as characteristic a feature of the countryside as the olive tree. Although Van Gogh encountered both trees in the vicinity of Arles, they did not claim his full attention until his stay at Saint-Rémy. But while his fascination with olive trees led to a coherent series of paintings, he never managed to paint a similar series of cypresses, even though he planned to. Nevertheless, he depicted cypresses more often than olive trees, as you can see if you scrutinize the paintings and drawings that he made in Provence. Very bright image. In southern Europe, especially in Italy, Greece, and the south of France, the dark, slender silhouette of the Cyprus is ubiquitous in rural areas. They are a stately presence in the rolling landscape, sometimes standing alone, sometimes in groups or rows, as frequently seen in Tuscany, as you see here on the left. They proliferate, proliferate on slopes and cluster in their hundreds in valleys, as on the Greek island of Corfu, here on the right, upper right. In Provence, it is common to see one or more cypresses near a farmhouse, but they can also form hedges to protect fruit orchards and gardens from the Mistral, the fierce wind that regularly blows across the countryside. Cypresses are also found in and around many Mediterranean cemeteries because for centuries they have been associated with death and mourning. In classical antiquity, uh, the Cyprus was the att attribute of various gods, including the Greek god Kronos, father of Zeus, and, uh, the god of time, and protection, protector of old persons. Thus, the Cyprus not only stands for longevity and, in Christianity, the hope of life after death, but it also symbolizes death itself. The tree derives its name from the Greek, Greek myth of Kyparissos, the best-known version of which comes from Ovid's Metamorphoses. While, hun while out hunting one day, Kyparissos accidentally killed his beloved pet stag, which had been a gift from his admirer, Apollo. Overcome by grief, he begged Apollo to let him mourn forever, whereupon the god changed him into a cypress. And ever since this, the tree has grown in and around cemeteries and other places of mourning. Like a dark pillar reaching towards heaven, this evergreen tree is a suitable symbol of eternal life and immortality. It can grow very old, and its hard, dry wood does not burn easily, facts that lend strength to the idea that this tough tree is well-nigh imperishable. Van Gogh declared in a letter from Saint-Rémy that the olive tree and the cypress have rarely been painted, and even though he may have put it too strongly, he did have a point because in Mediterranean landscapes and paintings of mythological scenes, as you see here, the cypress is often relegated into the background, more so than the olive tree, perhaps, with all its Christian symbolism. Even so, since the age of Romanticism, cypresses have appeared in numerous nature studies made by artists who traveled across uh, southern Europe. We also encounter this tree in the oeuvre of the Italian realists, the so-called Macchiaioli, and in the works of artists from Marseille, who were the first to paint the rugged landscape of Provence, in which the stately cypress is just as much as home, at home as the olive tree. And you see some examples here from those artists. In late 19th century, the Swiss symbolist painter Arnold Bucklin, and we have him here, masterfully portrayed the cypress as a symbol of mourning. Cypresses are a fixture of his Italian landscapes, which exude an air of mystery and menace. Bucklin's most famous works 
are the various versions of the Toten Insel, the Isle of the Dead, which he painted between 1880 and 1900. And in this first version, which you can see on the right, we see a rowing boat conveying a veiled, a veiled figure, completely clad in white and standing by a coffin. And the boat moors at a dark island with a chapel in the midst of thick cypresses, extending like dark columns into the deep blue firmament. Before traveling to Provence, Van Gogh had never seen cypresses, and he was fascinated by their form and color. The first time he depicted the cypress was in an early drawing he made in Arles, the only one that bears a date. And you see it here, and the date is inscribed uh, at the bottom, Arles, March 1888. And this is just after arriving uh, in Arles. Even though he took greater pains with the pollard willows by the side of the rose, road, further on he used thin pen strokes to draw a tall cypress next to a small Provencal farmhouse called a mas. And more to the left, he depicted three more cypresses in the distance. Later, he made a painting based on this drawing, which you see here. And in Provence, um, the symbol was a, a traditional symbol of uh, hospitality. And the number of trees was also significant. Many of these typical Provencal farmhouses have three cypresses planted in a triangle near the entrance. According to an old custom, travelers who saw three trees knew that they were welcome to eat, drink, and sleep there. If there were two trees, one could stop there to eat and drink. But a solitary tree, as in this painting and the drawing next to the house, meant that it was not even worth knocking on the door, because no one was welcome there. It's hard to say whether or not this tradition was still alive at Van Gogh's time, but in any case, he was probably unaware of it. Van Gogh also painted another typical feature of the Provencal countryside, namely hedges consisted of, consisting of cypresses. And these works belong to the series of orchards that he produced in April 1888. These two paintings uh, were supposed to form a triptych along with a third vertical canvas, but Van Gogh later declared them pendants. They show the same orchards, one with peach trees in the foreground and you can see this peach tree here appearing in the other painting on the right. And the other orchard, uh, the adjoining one, has pear trees. The works are executed in different styles. One painting featuring sharp lines and large areas of colors with no shadows, an effect Van Gogh had observed in the Japanese prints he so greatly admired. The other displays a distinctively uh, pointillist style. Later in Saint-Rémy, Van Gogh would become obsessed with capturing the thick, undulating structure of the cypresses and their use of dark green and bronze, but here he painted them with straight, thin brushstrokes intended to emphasize the tree's slenderness and height. At first, Van Gogh used cypresses, as you can see here, uh, to enliven the background and to add dark accents to the landscapes that he painted just outside the city. In Arles, he was seeking strong color contrasts, and the elongated elegance of the cypress made a striking effect in his sun-drenched landscapes, like a dark green torch standing out against a bright light, an eye-catcher on the horizon. His paintings of expensive wheat fields feature very tall cypresses, painted with swirling brushstrokes, so that they tower unrealistically above the landscape. The dark green of the hedge of cypresses here on the right in the painting and the drawing, stands up out nicely against a bright yellow and harmonizes with the green tones in the field and the sky. Van Gogh made a drawing based on this painting, which you can see here on the right, and this was to send uh, the drawing to his brother Theo so that he would have an idea of the recent painting, paintings that he'd made. And in this drawing, he used dark par parallel lines to define the forms of the cypresses. At the end of July, 1888, Van Gogh painted a garden with a profusion of summer flower and plants, like one big explosion of color. He described the painting to his sister, Wilhelmine, in a letter in which he named every species of flowers and plants. His sister, like uh, Vincent, loved flowers. And at the end, uh, he quotes, or I quote, sorry, uh, black cypresses against little low white houses with orange roofs and a delicate, green-blue strip of sky. 
he also made a painting of the park in front of his house, which, as he described it, uh, with, as he described it, a weeping ash and some cedars and cypresses. The cypresses high, rising high, blue-green. You can't see much of this in the painting, though. Um, the cypresses are here. Um, because this painting, of course, hardly includes any sky. We also see cypresses. Sorry, am I skipping one? Yeah, oops. I'm sorry, I'm showing you my whole presentation. That's not the idea. Here we are. Um, the drawing on the right. Um, you see the, uh, the park in front of his house, which came to be known as the Yellow House. You see it here in the background. And um, you see the same cypresses uh, in front of his house in the park. In September of that year, Van Gogh made several paintings of the park, which he called the Poet's Garden. He wanted to decorate his house with them, and he planned to hang the canvases of the Poet's Garden in the room intended for Paul Gauguin, whose arrival he, he was eagerly awaiting. As he wrote to Gauguin, he hoped that these paintings would highlight what he called the essence of what constitutes the changeless character of the region. This included the cypress and also the oleander, a typical southern bush that blossoms profuse, profu profusely and symbolized in Van Gogh's eye vitality and joy. As he wrote in late September 1888, the oleanders bloomed inexhaustibly and were always putting out strong new shoots. In those days, Van Gogh associated the oleander and the cypress with the Italian poets and painters of the Renaissance, about whom he had read an article. In a letter to his brother Theo, he wrote, Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio, Giotto and Botticelli, what an impression that made on me, reading those people's letters. Now Petrarch was just near here in Avignon and I see the same cypresses and oleanders. I've tried to put something of that into one of the gardens, painted with thick impasto, lemon yellow and yellow lemon green. And that's the painting we see here. This was the first version of the, uh, the first painting of the poet's garden. But whereas the oleander stood for the joy of life, the cypress had traditionally been associated with death also in Van Gogh's mind, as is apparent from the letter in which he described this painting. Thus the oleanders, covered in fresh blooms, as Van Gogh wrote, contrast both in color and meaning with, as he called it, the funereal cypress, completely black, that rises up behind it. And you see it in the background on the left. In the fourth and last canvas of the poet's garden, intended for the decoration of Gauguin's bedroom, the park made way for a row of very pastose cypresses, which, together with the strolling couple and the moon, were meant to convey the poetic imagination. Unfortunately, this painting is known only from a black and white photograph. It was probably lost in the Second World War. But luckily, Vincent described its color in a letter to Theo. A row of green cypresses against a pink sky with a pale lemon crescent moon foreground a piece of wasteland and some sand and a few thistles. Two lovers, the man pale blue with a yellow hat, the woman has a pink bodice and a black skirt. Shirt, skirt. <laughs> Van Gogh no doubt painted this canvas largely or even completely from the imagination. In particular, the pink of the sky and the green of the cypresses must have made a spectacular effect. He used this color combination again in his olive pickers in Saint-Rémy, a painting in which he wanted to express peace and comfort. And you've seen the image in Nikki's uh, talk. In November 1888, Van Gogh painted an evocation of the garden of his parental home, reminiscence of the garden at Etten. This work took shape under the influence of Gauguin, who encouraged him to work completely from the imagination. Here the cypresses have po poetic connotations and their flaming forms are accentuated more than ever before. Van Gogh wrote the following to his sister. I know it isn't perhaps much of a resemblance, but for me it conveys the poetic character and the style of the garden as I feel them. He also told her to imagine that the two women represented her and her mother, their mother, not the likeness so much as the colors. While the bizarre lines, I quote Van Gogh here, sought out and multiplied and snaking all over the painting aren't intended to render the garden in its vulgar resemblance, 
but draw it for us as if seen in a dream, in character and yet at the same time stranger than the real reality. In the sower, which was also painted from the imagination, Van Gogh gave the sky the colors he had observed during an evening walk. A sickly lemon, lemon yellow sunset, mysterious of extraordinary beauty, Prussian blue cypresses, and you see them on the right in the very background. For a long time, Van Gogh had been toying with the powerful image of dark blue cypresses against yellow, and in the spring he had already conceived a plan to capture this image in paint. And he wrote then, at the time, I also need a starry night with cypresses, or perhaps above a field of ripe wheat. There are some really beautiful nights here. He finally painted that starry night with cypresses more than a year later in Saint-Rémy, in mid-June 1889. Van Gogh must have been turning this idea over in his mind ever since his arrival in Saint-Rémy, because his room in the asylum afforded him a panoramic view of the wheat fields and the low mountains of the Alpil. He also wrote that he could see from his window, long before sunrise, the morning star looming large in the sky. In contrast to the starry night over the Rhone, which he had painted in Arles, this starry night did not originate outdoors, but in the studio. Van Gogh composed the painting from the imagination with the help of his own works. The two large cypresses, standing prominently in the foreground in Starry Night, seem to have been loosely based on the tall and dark cypress, as he called it, that takes pride of place in the very first painting that he made outside of the asylum grounds here on the left. In Starry Night, Van Gogh painted the cypresses with long undulating brush strokes of dark green, brown, and deep purple. Here he continued his search for more style, expressing emotions by, mean of by means of suggestive colors and flowing rhythm rhythmical lines, just as he had tried to do in reminiscence of the garden at Eton. Immediately after Starry Night, Van Gogh made two paintings that feature the cypresses themselves as the main subject. Once again, he observed the trees from nature according to his usual working methods. On 25 June 1889, he wrote to Theo that there had been a couple of beautiful days and that he was working on 12 large canvases, including two studies of cypresses of that difficult shade of bottle green. On these canvases, he used exceptionally thick impasto in the manner of Adolf Monticelli, the painter from Marseille whose work Van Gogh admired greatly. The cypresses, he wrote, still preoccupy me. I'd like to do something with them, like the canvases of the sunflowers, because it, is, it astonishes me that no one has yet done them as I see them. It's beautiful as regards lines and proportions, like an Egyptian obelisk. And the green has such distinctive, distinguished quali quality is the dark patch in a sun-drenched landscape, but it's one of the most interesting dark notes, the most difficult to hit off exactly that I can imagine. In the paintings of sunflowers he made in Arles, to which he referred here, Van Gogh had achieved a very personal rendition of that motif, both in the painterly sense and in terms of meaning. Later he wrote that after painting the sunflowers, he had been searching for, for I quote, the contrary and yet the equivalent. And that became the Cyprus. For Van Gogh, sunflowers symbolized gratitude, hope, and friendship. Assuming that he saw the Cyprus as the counterpart of the sunflower, not only in terms of color, but also in essence, he now seems to be referring to the melancholy and mournfulness traditionally associated with the Cyprus. Another of the 12 canvases he was working on that June portrays the Cyprus, and it's the one on the left, uh, in his own words, as the dark patch in a sun-drenched landscape. Van Gogh himself ultimately thought this one, his, this one of his best canvases of the summer, the one on the left. And in September, he painted two more versions of it, which you see also on the screen. Of his two canvases with cypresses as the main subject, so the ones I showed you here, um, he only sent this one, the, the one on the left, to Theo in Paris. The other canvas, sorry, he only sent, uh, here I go again. 
So these two canvases, he, saw, he sent the other one to Theo in Paris, and this one he kept for himself. And at the time, it still didn't have any figures in it, but he added them in February, when he decided to give the canvas to the young poet and art critic Albert Aurier, as a token of gratitude for the praise Aurier had heap, heaped on him in an article published in the Mercure de France, the literary, literary magazine of the symbolists. The title of the articles, Les Isolés, Vincent van Gogh, means the isolated ones, and it's considered the first serious publication about the artist. Theo had sent the article at the end of January to Vincent, much to the surprise of Vincent, who was recovering from another, albeit brief, crisis in his illness. In his article, Aurier had, praised his, had expressed his great appreciation for the paintings with cypresses. Van Gogh thanked him in a letter, in which he promised to send this painting to him. And I quote, I shall add a study of cypresses for you to the next consignment I send to my brother. I'm still working on it at the moment, wanting to put in a small figure. In the end, he put in two figures and subsequently made for himself a drawing and a small painted version of the adapted composition. In his article, Aurier had written about the cypresses that expose their nightmarish, flame-like black silhouettes. Van Gogh also responded to this in his thank you letter. The cypress is so characteristic of the landscape of Provence, and you sensed it when saying even the color black. Until now, I have not been able to do them as I feel it. However, before leaving here, I'm planning to return to the fray to attack the cypresses. Since painting the canvases of cypresses in the summer, Van Gogh had depicted them only sporadically. And here are some examples. He still felt the need to continue his exploration of these trees, trees as a subject in their own right, and likewise the Alpils, because, as he wrote, to give an idea of Provence, it's vital to do a few more canvases of cypresses and mountains. But in the end, nothing, nothing came of it. In late February, Van Gogh suffered another attack of his illness, which laid him low for two months. In the intervals between these periods of illness, he made several paintings and a group of drawings of imaginary landscapes and working figures, including a reminiscence of Brabant, which is his native uh, home in the Netherlands, a dream image of the village in, in the Netherlands, where he grew up, but with Mediterranean cypresses here, that tower above the thatched farmhouses. Shortly before leaving the asylum in Saint-Rémy in May 1890, Van Gogh painted a large landscape in which he once again cast the cypress in the leading role. In this nocturnal scene, painted entirely from the imagination, he brought together such typical Provençal elements as the cypresses, the wheat fields, the alpil, and the starry night. And he included in the background the thatched roofs that he had characterized earlier as reminiscences of the north. In a letter to Gauguin, he described the landscape as very romantic, if you like, but also Provençal, I think. Van Gogh never realized his ambition to, of creating an ensemble of impressions of Provence, but in this canvas, which marked his departure from the south of France, he summed up beautifully the impressions that, that he took with him, including the cypress, the dark patch, the poetic symbol of melancholy and eternity. Van Gogh continued to cherish this motif in Auvers sur Oise, where he spent his last, the last, week of his li last weeks of his life. The tuyas, uh, big trees growing in Dr. Gachet's garden, were strangely evocative, as Dr. Gachet's son so aptly put it, of the cypresses of Provence. In this painting of a white house at dusk, featuring a large radiant sky, a uh, star in the sky, again. Um, the cypresses enhance the dreamlike atmosphere. So you see how he's continuing to include them uh, in his paintings as a poetic symbol um, of eternity. And um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ninka, for that fascinating talk. 
And another reminder to our virtual audience to please enter your questions in the chat window of our YouTube page, and we'll be able to answer them and happy to following our next lecture by our esteemed colleague, Renska cohen Terfert. Renska is curator at the Kruller Muller Museum in the Netherlands, which has the second largest holding of Van Gogh's works after the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Renska holds an MA in art history from the University of Amsterdam and specializes in the visual arts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries with a specific interest in the history of collecting and the international art market. Renska has curated or co-curated co several exhibitions at the Kruller Muller since 2018, including Odilon Radon, Literature and Music, Drawn from Life, Works on Paper from 1850 to 1950, not in so many words in 2020, and Aged Well, Three Centuries of Drawings from the Kruller Muller Collection just last year. She was also co-author and coordinator of the publication Van Gogh, All Works in the Kruller Muller Museum from 2020. For her talk today, Renska will examine the appeal of the Alpil Mountains for Van Gogh during his time in Provence. Please join me in welcoming Renska to the podium. Thank you, Nicole Myers. It's so exciting to be here. It was quite a challenge, um, but we're here. So, on 19 February 1888, Vincent van Gogh, sorry, I'll pronounce it in Dutch, Vincent van Gogh left Paris by train. After a journey of a day and a night, he arrived in the Provence in the south of France. In a letter to his brother Theo, he described the landscape of Arles as flat, with mountains in the background of the most delicate lilac. This small range of low mountains that he could see from a distance was the Chain des Alpilles, a chain of limestone hills located between the rivers de Rhone and de Durance. In this map, I've encircled Arles on the left. Northeast of Arles, the mountain range is located, and north of, uh, north of it is Saint-Rémy. In this talk, I will try to capture the different reasons Van Gogh became captivated by the Alpilles. First in Arles, as a reference to Japanese prints and as a pictorial motif to enhance the composition of his landscape paintings. While in Saint-Rémy, it became a subject matter in its own right and is an essential motif for his ensemble imp uh, impressions of the Provence. Expecting a sun-drenched Arles, when Van Gogh stepped off the train in the southern city, seen here in the painting on the left, he was confronted by a snowy landscape. According to the artist, there had been a snowfall of at least 23 inches all over, and it was still snowing. He wrote to Theo, the landscape under the snow, with the white peaks against a sky as bright as the snow, was just like the winter landscapes the Japanese did. In Paris, Van Gogh fell under the spell of Japanese woodcuts, and Nicole Myers already underlined their Im impact on his work. When he left pa uh, Paris behind, he not only set off to, to the south to find a little piece of quiet, he also hoped to find the clearness of the atmosphere and the gay color effects of Japanese prints. He experienced and looked at the area through a Japanese lens. Hence, the landscape with the blue grayish mountains at the horizon, especially after the snow melted and spring commenced, satisfied the goal of his journey to find the equivalent of Japan in the south of France. What what struck him most in the south was the clarity of the air and that even in a distance one could make out the color of things. He wrote, at home we see a vague gray line on the horizon. Here the line is sharp and the shape recognizable from far, far away. This gives an idea of space and air. In the 14 months he spent in Arles, the blue or purple line of the Alpi appeared regularly in his landscape paintings. 
Nevertheless, in most cases, the blue or purple mountains on the horizon were a pictorial motif and used to increase the intensity of color by following the theory of simultaneous contrast, dividing the ochre or green fields of the vast open plains from the blue skies. In his eyes, the panoramic landscapes of the Provence didn't fade into gray. It stayed green to the last line, and that last line was lilac or blue or purple, the range of hills. The best example of is, this famous, is his famous painting, The Harvest. He depicted the harvesting of wheat, um, uh, the contrast between the wild and romantic foreground and the broad, tranquil, distant prospects with their horizontal lines shading off until they reached the chain of the Alpi, he found this contrast very picturesque. From his arrival on Arl onwards, the mountains themselves beckoned. Fochuk went on several hikes on the plain of Lacrau, about three miles to the northeast of the village. On one of these outings, he spotted a ruined medieval abbey on a hill surrounded by hollies, pines, and gray olive trees. In the second week of May, 1888, the abbey of Mont Majeur became the subject of a set of seven drawings known as the Mont Majeur series, and followed by a second series in July. On that occasion, Van Gogh worked on larger sheets and created six drawings, which are real highlights in his oeuvre. While he was interested in the rugged surroundings of the hills, he was mainly fascinated by, and in the way the opposite, the immense flat expanse of the plains. Seen in bird's eye view from the top of a hill, he was mesmerized by the vineyards, harvested wheat fields streaming away like the surface of a sea towards the horizon bounded by the hills. He wrote, it must be 50 times that I've been to Mont Majeur to look at this flat view. I go back there, go back, go back again. Well, I've done two drawings of it, of that flat landscape in which there was nothing but the infinite eternity. In August 1888, after working on his Mont Majeur series, Fochoch told his sister, I wouldn't mind going a bit further though, where the land isn't as flat as I've actually never seen a mountain in my life. We'll do that sometime when Gauguin is here and as soon as he comes, would like to go on a walking tour together all over Provence. As we know now, the collaboration with Paul Gauguin turned into a fiasco a few months later, followed by several mental breakdowns. One of the last paintings he made around Arles, featuring the Alpi, uh, was La Croix with peach trees in blossom. Early May, he had himself committed into a private clinic 16 miles from Arles in the foothills of the Alpi. After moving to the, uh, to the asylum in Saint-Rémy on 8 May 1889, Fochouk became in instantly captivated by the scenery he was able to glimpse from his bedroom window. To his brother he wrote, through the iron-barred iron window I can make out a square of wheat in an enclosure above which in the morning I see the sunrise in its glory. The Walden wheat field, with the dramatic backdrop of the Alpi, would become one of the principal subjects during his time at the asylum, and with around 10 paintings, a series in its own right. Fachoch started dividing the landscape in three parts, sky, mountains, and fields or groves. The mountainscape with its rugged forms were still part of the background, but became a more pronounced element in the composition. It became a means of closing off the background of his compositions. Beside this, the diagonal slope of the mountains creates a more dynamic composition in the upper half of the canvas. Additionally, the rolling outlines of the peaks mirror the often wavy forms in the lower half of the painting, thereby enhancing the rhythm and structure in the composition. This is, for example, very clear in this painting, with the moon just rising over the Alpi, illuminating the wheat sheaves in the foreground. Fochoch spent a long time working on this canvas and painted it largely in his studio. Although he believed that painting from reality was the most important, 
fellow artists Gauguin and Emile Bernard encouraged him to work from imagination and memory the year before. Synthetism, uh, as his style was called, and Nicole Myers already mentioned, emphasized the role of memory, imagination, and personal expression. The artist's feelings about a subject were to be visualized through bright patches of anti-naturalistic color, abstracted shapes and flat decorative patterns, and lines contorted like those of ancient woodcuts. The starry night and wheat filled with cypresses, originating slightly before wheat filled with rising moon, were also created, both created from memory. It is interesting that in all these paintings, the placement of the rough, sparsely covered mountain walls of the Old P and the formation of the mountain range itself, as seen from Van Gogh's bedroom window, have become a fixed element. They seem to be etched into his memory. From June onwards, Van Gogh was venturing outside the walled grounds of the hospital. He went on daily outings to explore and paint his surroundings. Since the Alpil were on his doorstep, they slowly became a more prominent feature in his paintings. One of the best examples is this magnificent painting with a grove of olive trees and the Alpil as a backdrop. In this case, the mountains are so well defined that we can actually, actually identify the formations. The first rock formation on the left, with its recognizable two holes, are the peaks of Le Rocher de Deux Trous, not a very imaginative name because it translates to the rock with two holes. The other formation, with the three distinctive crests on the right, is the Mont Gosier. These two rock formations are situated directly um, south of the asylum. If Fachoc leaned out of his window, which faced east, he might have been able to see, with difficulty, their peaks. Only a five to ten minute walk sufficed to get a really good view. Nevertheless, as the entry in the recent exhibition catalogue on the olive groves informs us, this painting was again painted mostly, and maybe even all of it, in his studio. The identifiable peaks underline Fachoch's statement during one of the discussions with Bernard that he didn't invent the entire painting, but that it was based on nature, albeit abstracted and exaggerated in line and color. In July, we can also find the first paintings of the Alpil as a subject in its own right. Mountes and Saint-Rémy was painted with topographical accuracy. Again, we can identify the two characteristic rock formations of Le Rocher de Deux Trous and the Mont Gosier, again expressly outlining the contours. But this time, as in real life, the mountains loom over the groves and over the house of which the roof is visible in the middle of the painting. Fachoch mentioned this painting several times in his letters, relating it to the book Le Sang de la Vie, translating Meeting of Life, by Édouard Rod, a French-Swiss novelist. This book was sent to him by, sister, uh, by his sisters Wilhelmine and Lies. He admitted that he didn't like the book at all, except for a passage about, and I quote, a desolate country of somber mountains, among which are some do dark goat herd huts where some flowers are blooming. And this was exactly what he painted. I especially love the detail of the bright yellow, white and pink flowers next to the road and the sunflowers slightly further in the background. Somehow the little dots of bright paint seem a bit out of place in the almost abstract landscape, built up with sweeping brush strokes. Vincent also painted around the same time entrance to a quarry. After looking at so many white landscapes in this presentation, this cropped image feels a bit claustrophobic. The green of the trees and foliage in the foreground, in a way functioning, functioning as theater curtains, partly shield off the entrance to the quarry. The slabs of stone uh, extracted from the quarry are visible on the right. It was the first time since moving to France that Van Gogh returned to muted colors, while working on this painting, he was not feeling well and sensed an attack of his illness coming on. Nonetheless, he was pleased with the result, and I quote, because, my taste, because to my taste, the dark greens go well with the ochre tones. There's something sad in them that's healthy, and that's why it doesn't annoy me. Shortly after finishing this painting, Van Gogh suffered a severe attack. 
and for six weeks he was unable to work for Wright. In September he took up his brush again, although he didn't venture far from the asylum at first. Nevertheless, a few weeks later, the beautiful autumn weather lured him slowly further afield. He headed off into the mountains in search of new subjects. Most of the canvases done during this time can be situated in or around the hills. I like this landscape uh, on the right with a view into the valley. The foot of the mountains very recognizable through his use of the colors blue and purple against the yellows, oranges and greens of the fields. The idea of creating an ensemble of his imp impressions of Provence and including this series of the LP took shape around this time while contemplating a return to the north. He found that it was difficult to leave before having something to prove that one has felt and loved the place. On October 5th, he wrote to his brother that he could certainly do a whole series of these Alpi. For now that I've been looking at them for such a long time, I'm getting rather used to them. Van Gogh felt that mountains were as characteristic of Provence as the, Alpi, uh, as, as the olive trees and cypresses. In 1887, Van Gogh had seen some of the mountain landscapes that Monet had done in the spring of 1884 in Menton at an exhibition at the art dealership Georges Petit in Paris. Nicole Myers already explained how Claude Monet's serial paintings would influence Van Gogh's work uh, of the fall uh, in 1889. Another reason why Van Gogh felt that the mountains were essential to his ensemble is a literary one. Van Gogh read Aventure Prodigieuse de Tartarin de Tarasson, Advent uh, Prodigious Adventures of uh, Tartarin of Tarasson, um, upon his arrival in the Provence, followed by Ta Tartarin sur les Alpes, or translated Tartarin on the Alps, uh, two sat uh, satirical uh, novels by Alphonse Daudet that mock the men of southern France. Tartarin, the central character of both books, is the president of the Tarasson Mountain Climbing Association, whose members have never been further than the foothills of the Alpi. In Tartarin on the Alps, uh, the, the main character goes to Switzerland to conquer the highest peaks of the, uh, in the Alps. Fogh absolutely loved the adventures of Tartarin, and he refers to him many times in his letters. With his paintings of the mountains, he wanted his brother to become better acquainted with good Tartarin's Alpi, which up to now, apart from the canvas of the mountains, Theo hadn't seen yet unfold, except in the distant background of the canvases. In these same letters from early October, Van Gogh mentions the subject he had already attacked in July an entrance to a quarry. This painting is very different from the version in July, not only in color, but also in design. Instead of trees partly block blocking the view, here the landscape is, landscape is more rugged and the quarry itself is the main focus point. A little figure is painted at the entrance, uh, which gives an idea of the immense size of the quarry. Fogel related the pale lilac rocks in reddish earth to certain Japanese drawings he had seen. I am showing here, you here two probable candidates. Working in the mountains wasn't easy, but he enjoyed it immensely. He informed Bernard, and I quote, It's enjoyable to work in really wild sites where you have to bury your easel in the stones so that the wind doesn't send everything flying to the ground. Other mountain studies from this time were of a very wild ravine where a slender stream weaves its way along its bed of rocks. This ravine, which was more like a deep valley with steep and less steep places, is again situated not far from the asylum. This part of the Alpi is called Le Péroulet. The name is derived from, from the Pérou or Peyrol, bull-shaped formations the rock have rocks have acquired through centuries of corrosion by the mountain water. He regarded this study as a pendant for the study which he called Mountain Summer Effect. This is the painting on the left that I showed earlier. 
The awe-inspiring nature of these unpopulated areas was where Van Gogh said to find a beautiful melancholy in the rock formations. To depict the spirit of this place convincingly, he tried to use a stronger and more uh, virile draftsmanship by simplifying and accentuating. He also wanted to prove, as he wrote to Bernard, that he hadn't yet gone soft. With these studies of the mountains, he wanted to explore the expressive potential of sentitism and connect in his own way to Bernard and Gauguin. His brother Theo was not especially receptive to these more stylized works. I can't, I can't help it that it makes me more like Bernard of, or Gauguin, he wrote to Theo, but I'm inclined to think that in the end you will, like, you will come to like it. He believed strongly that the expressive potential of sentitism resulted in paintings in which you would be able, uh, and I quote, to feel the whole of the region. Unaware at the time, Van Gogh succeeded in connecting with the two Frenchmen through this painting. Uh, five months later, in March 1890, Gauguin saw the ravine at the exhibition of the Independent in Paris, and he wrote to Van Gogh, I offer you my sincere compliments and for many artists, you are the most remarkable in the exhibition. With things from nature, you're the only one here uh, there who thinks. The one I'm talking about is a mountain landscape. Two tiny travelers seem to be climbing up there in search of the unknown. It contains an emotion a la Delacroix, with a very evocative color. Here and there, red notes like lights, the whole in a violet note. It's beautiful and imposing. I've talked at length about it with Aurier, Bernard, and many others. All send you their compliments. The museum nowadays at the MFA in Boston came into Gauguin's possession shortly after his exhibition through an exchange of paintings coordinated by Theo. Uh, work on this mountain series became secondary when he learned of Gauguin, Gauguin's and Bernard's Christ in the Garden of Olives in November, which resulted in the main focus on the Olive Grove series. The great need to do more paintings of the Alpi remained and late November, early December, he picked up the subject again. Although in these two examples, the main subject is the wheat field in the foreground. While Van Gogh was working on repetitions of his olive groves to bring that particular series to its conclusion, he also regarded the subject of the ravine important enough to make a repetition of it. Using short brushstrokes and a multitude of colors, he painted the rocks and the brook white and foaming. He left the canvas unpainted in many areas. According to him, this imparted atmosphere and, since he was very regularly out of paint, didn't need as much paint. He was so satisfied with the repetition that he even called it a tableau. So not a study of nature, but a mature landscape painting. He told Theo the work showed more suppressed passion. He regarded it as one of his best paintings from his time in Saint-Rémy, and it fueled the desire to do more canvases of cypresses and mountains. But despite the wish to finish his ensemble of the impressions of the Provence, it unfortunately would not come to pass, and the LP never developed into a real series. In the first months of 1890, leading up to Van Gogh's move to auvers sur oise the mountains were slowly pushed to the background of his paintings again. Even in the last painting from Saint-Rémy, which he created from memory, the mountain range plays a supporting role in his compositions. Although mountain views did not become the core of his Provence oeuvre as Van Gogh had imagined they would, they are definitely am among his most characteristic landscape paintings. Since his time, much of the region where he worked has changed. Orchards and wheat fields have been replanted or have disappeared, as well as farmhouses and other elements in Van Gogh's images. The ravine with its little river is not there anymore, either. 
In 1891, a year after the artist's death, a dam was constructed which changed the character of the place permanently. Still, the Alpil have remained a fixed element on the horizon of the Provence. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Brenska, for that thought-provoking and just dazzling presentation on the mountains. Thank you again, both of you, for being here with us today. So we are happy to take questions that are, I believe, hopefully coming in through the YouTube channel. But before we do that, I have a question for you, Ninka. I think it's really interesting that he'll continue to paint cypress trees, even after he leaves. You know, of course, he was painting the olive trees, painting the alpeel. Why do you think the cypress tree was the one that he took with him? Well, I think. Um, oh, well, I think it is also in Over there are um, trees that are a bit similar to them, although they're not cypresses. So it's quite easy to transform them into cypresses, and it's it's a shape that. Um, that has that has this very this characteristic for him um, these swirling lines. I think it's something that he just really liked, and it, it's providing a dark note and it, a sort of contrast where you need it. So, for example, in the last painting that I showed of the White House, uh, which is a a very mysterious painting, it provides it adds to that to that character. I think that's why he. He liked it so much, and um, it has a kind of poetic resonation. Um, and well, in, as in the garden of uh, Dr. Gachet, of course, similar trees were there, although they were not cypresses. So, but it's 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 a nice thing. He sort of like the poplars that that are growing in the Netherlands. In his painting of the reminiscence of the North, he just sort of makes them cypress-like, yeah. <laughs> Something that belongs with him by then. I love that. Yeah. And I have a question for you, Renska. And I don't know that there's an answer. But we know a lot about Van Gogh's feelings about various trees that he'll depict throughout his career. You know, he's not only interested in olive trees or cypress trees, you know. Um, it's something that is just an interesting subject unto itself, either personal symbolism or deeper symbolism based on the regions they're connected to. But for the mountains, where then they would become this focus, as far as I know in the letters, he doesn't really talk about any kind of symbolism or meaning or any kind of hints. Just curious to know if you've thought about that, of given how symbolic these other subjects are in the impressions of Provence, of course the Alpil are there, they're visually striking, but do you think that there was a deeper meaning for the artist that maybe he didn't hint at in his letters? Yeah, well, I tried to search for some kind of symbolist meaning uh, of these mountains, and I, I, I did the same as you, read the letters over and over again to find some kind of meaning. So it's just speculation, to be honest, because he didn't write about it. Um, yeah, mountains are not cultivated. It's a real, it's, uh, it's the real the essence of earth. So I feel, in a way, but this is again speculation, um, that it's uh, you. You can't get closer to nature in 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 and those ro really wild nature um, in the mountains. So I had a feeling that that be also because he does talk about um, uh, yeah this rough uh, surroundings that he's really searching for that um, and yeah appar yeah he apparently it's kind of a spirit, spiritual uh, experience for him as well but again it's speculation i don't know it's it's he doesn't write about it so i w i wish he would <laughs> i like that there is there's also, something primal about it yeah well um as a dutchman of course uh, to see mountains to experience them um this was the first time he was actually surrounded by them so um yeah it's so completely different and um 
it's it's the power of nature i think that you really feel uh, or that he has really felt uh, being there um yeah i think especially i mean imagining him coming on the train to, from paris and seeing these these hills uh appear must be must have been quite uh, exciting yeah yeah, it was really the third sentence, I think, in his first letter to, to Theo, uh, when he writes about his arrival in, in Arlet, he writes that he sees these mountains in the background. So it's one of the first things he notices. Yeah. I love that. All right. Stacy, do we have questions? Yeah, we have one from our virtual audience, and it's for uh, Nicole. Can you say more about the link Van Gogh made between particular sets of complementary colors and the seasons? And was that his idea, or did he distill it from somewhere? That is a great question. It becomes fun when you read through the letters, and you get that from 1884, that he's associating seasons with these contrasting complementaries. Then when you see his production, it really takes off in Provence. You start to see those, um, where often compositions will be boiled down to a yellow sky and purple mountains, for example. Um, whether he gets that from other artists, I actually don't know. It seems so unique to him in, in my thinking about Van Gogh and other artists working in the late 19th century. Many artists were working with color theory, so he was not the first and not the only to be um, not just using it to give visual brilliance, but potentially even attaching symbolic meaning to it. But it is something that, as you saw, is such a thread throughout his production. You know, even when he thinks he's doing it, even if we don't see it, it's still there as kind of part of thinking. Of course, when he's using complementary contrast, it's not always to symbolize the season, but when you're looking for those patterns, they really do emerge in the landscapes and you get that sense of continuity. Yes, and I think, um, of course, the, the green for spring and then with its complementary of, of pink is a very... Uh, well, it, you you can find it with many artists, of course, but it's he expressively mentioned it. Um, uh, spring is green, the summer is you know yellow and blue, and and then of course there were other colors for for autumn. But um, he was always searching for the contrast, um, and um, yeah, I think I think it's it's typical, but it's also typical of those artists at the time, like Delacroix, the, the impressionists, the neo impressionists. They were always combining and uh, making the most powerful contrast. So um, he's very much a, a child of his time, too, I would say. Yeah, I still don't know another Impressionist or post-Impressionist that will use it that um, dramatically, mm. where you'll have the yep. two dominant tones or um, with the women picking olives in the end of the Olive Grove series, where you get both. You get a pink sky with green trees, and then you get purple earth you know, with yellow sort of accents in the landscape. And I, I love that, that as he's refining his compositions, he often sort of pulls out those contrasting colors. We don't see him do a lot of the white and black, though, where he talks about winter being white and black. And for various reasons, we don't seem to have winter depictions as much in his production. When he does a winter landscape, it's a copy after Millet, um, uh, after a print. So he paints... He makes a painting after a print by Millet, and he it's actually more purplish, or it used to be more purplish, and it's a winter scene, so it's still a very warm tone. Um, yeah, but I think it's what struck me again when going through the letters, searching for cypresses. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's fascinating how he's so systematic in his choosing colors. So the cypresses are really the green, dark green note, and often there's oleanders with their pink... Um, pink flowers so it's it's always the um yeah the contrast that he's searching for which also has a symbolical meaning and i quite like that i mean it's maybe he's projecting also but it doesn't matter it's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> another question is um dr myers you mentioned that van gogh pulled back from a very heavy impasto at this moment so could any of you tell us more about his experimentation with paint application in these series yeah, it's interesting that he writes about that with the fall olive groves for these paintings in November that he starts to do. And he says that he's not using the thick impostos. There are still thick applications of paint within those fall olive groves, but it's most noticeable in the foregrounds of those paintings that are all very similar, where he dilutes the paint 
to create kind of a wash of color and then kind of does those horizontal stippling or dashes over it. Some of the pictures you can actually see that thinned out paint kind of dripping down along the bottom of the edge. I mean, for him, I think again, he was wanting to do such an about face um, from the synthetism that Gauguin and Bernard have been doing that he'd been experimenting with. And he sort of associates that perhaps with expressive brushwork. And then also maybe these more thick, um, applications of paint so it's kind of part of that retraction of going to a style that's more orderly and then even using less paint he'll say to Theo that this would not only allow him to be more economical it uses less paint and so it would go further um, but that it also would allow him to capture more of those atmospheric effects in the you know olive groves that he's trying to seek the kind of morning and night so I find that really fascinating the heartbreaking part of that uh, is that it also becomes clear in the letters that he comes to associate that synthetist style and potentially even the application of paint with his illness, which had come back. And so, you know, this kind of antidote against the style was to adopt something more in line with realism, but that I think that there was also a hope that, you know, and not using his imagination, but then also having a more controlled application of paint that he was kind of fending off abstraction while fending off illness. So that's kind of an undercurrent that we get um, through the letters. But I wouldn't say that he applies that style to all the other works as you saw in both presentations that he's working on in the fall. So when he talks about that, it's really specifically with those trees, um, again, because he's you know, according to him, kind of you know attacking this problem of synthetism um, in this very deliberate way through this um, aspect of the series. Uh, did Van Gogh ever travel to Japan? Or if not, where did he become really familiar um, with those prints and those works that inspired him? <laughs> he never traveled to Japan, although I'm sure he would have loved to. but. Um, uh, but he became acquainted with the art, uh, especially with the prints, because in, in Paris at the time, they were very much, uh, um, they were everywhere, basically. Uh, there was a really vogue for Japanese things um, among artists, but also uh, in, in a lot of shops, uh, you could sell them very cheaply. Uh, artists were inspired by them. Um, so, so it was really something that was... Uh, the talk of the town in a way and when Van Gogh came to Paris um, he he quickly uh, acquired a whole a group of those prints and um, and he was he was just completely fascinated by their their colors the lines the 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 sort of the way of of looking at nature uh, that they represented for him so um, it uh, he didn't need to go to Japan because he had these these um, these images uh, of a country that he could then sort of make his own um, fantasy about. Other questions? No? And if anyone, we have a handful, literally, of um, audience members here in Horcho Auditorium with us at the DMA. If any of you have questions, please raise your hand and a mic will be passed along to you so that listeners from home can hear you. Yes, hold on one second, a microphone's going to come to you. Hi, um, to what degree do you think Pizarro influenced Van Gogh and specifically his rejection of synthesism? Do you want to talk about Pizarro and Inca? That's, that's, should I repeat it quick? No, you, of course. Um, you had the microphone. Um, no, that's an interesting question, actually. I um, I don't think Van Gogh was opposed to uh, either synthetism or neo-impressionism. He was using that, employing that, but um, he was uh, a great admirer of Pizarro, and he uh, they, they knew each other in Paris. They... Uh, they spent time discussing uh, color theory, even, and um, I think he he did look at this what what Pissarro was doing. Um, he was he was not so much rejecting the the style of synthetism, but more working completely from the imagination. Um, 
he felt he needed to be really um, immersed in nature and that should be the, the starting point. So I think Pissarro was, was very much working in that same way. Um, he did not use synthesism as a style, but um, they were they were really, um, I think they were thinking in the same way that nature was the starting point and then you, you um, use your own feelings to make a, a, something more personal about it. Is that a... <laughs> yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you made that distinction too about sort of what he's rejecting in, in terms of kind of doing this um, about face because as much as he insists on the fact that, you know, he's going out into the olive groves, you need to reimmerse yourself in nature, that this is the path that he thinks for himself, you know, he needs to pursue. If you look at those November paintings, they're synthesized. I mean, especially the Minneapolis picture, which is the only one with the sun and the alpeel with the yellow sky in the background. I always love to point out, if you look at the shadows, which way they're going in the landscape, and then you look at the sun, and they don't line up. So, you know, we have to sort of read between the lines and the letters and think, you know, about what it is that was disturbing him. And again, that entire reliance on invention or abstraction or imagination for him, he felt like, you know, that was the dangerous setback, that it was kind of um, shaky ground <laughs> in many ways. Um, yeah, and there was also the idea that, as, well, he, he, he even said, Bernard is really, he hasn't even seen an olive tree, you know, <laughs> so he's he's also feeling very a, a appropriate yeah, the about sort of the subject. Proprietary, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, he's still, of course, he's, he's also synthesizing all the time. I mean, you never you do that as an artist. But he um, um, he was using in a way he was doing the same thing. He was searching for the essence, but uh, not inventing something uh, like Gauguin and Bernard were, were doing with Christ's in the Garden of Olives. He would he <laughs> he felt that was the wrong way to go. So um, yeah. And, and Pissarro wouldn't have painted that either, <laughs> I <Yep>. think. <laughs> there we're starting to see the break in, you know, what happens after Impressionism. Then we have Neo-Impressionism, which we associate with pointillism with Seurat. And then again, the artists that decide that they want to focus on subjectivity, what's on the inside thoughts and feelings versus objectivity, which had been so grounded in those other two styles. Okay, I'm going to turn it to the two of you to see if you have questions or things you want to talk about before we potentially wrap on our symposium, putting them on the spot. Hello. Um, I think there, are all, there will always be questions. I mean, <laughs> we've been studying this group of paintings for such a long time, and you still feel there's mystery. So, um, no, I don't have a particular one right now, but I'm, I'm really dying to see the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for tuning in from home. And for those few of you who've joined us today here in the auditorium, we're grateful to see you again, Van Gogh and the Olive Groves. We have one more week here in Dallas. The show is open through February 6th. If you haven't seen it, we hope that you will come and spend time in the exhibition. And even if you have come back, you are guaranteed to see something new every time you look at these incredible paintings. And for those of you fortunate enough to potentially get to see the show, in Amsterdam. It will be on view there spring through early summer. And for those of you, again, who would like more content, uh, whether it's on this exhibition or on other DMA exhibitions and programs, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And this talk will be uploaded there as well uh, for anyone who would like to watch it again. Anyway, thank you all again so much. Goodbye. <laughs>